I'm an architect originally. I've got two degrees in architecture and I'm a licensed architect and I fell into designing for TV purely accidentally. And I discovered that it's the most creative thing that you could do as a designer. I mean, I drive to work some days laughing out loud that, literally laughing out loud, that I get paid to do what I do. And uh, what I liked about architecture was that there was a creativity that was applied to reality. But you would do one project in a year or two years. In television, you can do 10, 20, 30 projects in a year. It's an unlimited amount of creativity that you get to try out in a non you know, dangerous way. I mean, if your building fails, you know, if you tried something risky, oh, good God, you know, there's lawsuits. If you try something adventurous on a TV show, it's no big deal. You know, film, not the same pace as TV. Uh, theater, not the same pace as TV. So when Kent asked me to talk to you guys, I thought, what would have I like to have known 17 years ago if I was starting out on this path and I wanted to try to be successful at it? And so I very quickly threw together a the, the seminal you know, piece of work on, on designing for television. Um, first of all, I think you've got to know where you're aiming yourself. If TV is what you want to do, and most of you probably are seduced by the glamour of film or theater, when you get down to it, there's an awful lot of work that happens in TV, and I've only subdivided this to seven sections, half hour, hour single camera, multi-camera sitcom type shows, music award shows, comedy, reality, commercials, movies of the weeks. Why do you care? If you are interested in uh, being successful, whether it's in this or in any other career path, you gotta figure out where your skills are and where they fit. Each one of these has a different, and I put it in what I call the TV success matrix. They, it has a different personality requirement, a different pay grade, a different stress level, uh, you know, a different creative uh, value, effectively, like multi-camera sitcom. To me, that's not very creative, but, you know, you're, you're making living rooms and you're making, you know, the mall or whatnot. But the money's pretty good. If you want a wife and kids, that's, that's the spot for you. So as you, whether it's in this career path, film, TV, think about the different aspects because they, there isn't one ideal place. I do a lot of work, and most designers work in maybe one or two of these categories. Some designers do their whole life in one category, the sitcom guys, say. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work in just about all of them. I don't do movies of the week, um, and I don't do single camera. The other reason it's important to identify these targets is the producers that produce these types of shows, they rarely produce anything else, and those are the guys that are your clients. So, as you think about it and you go, hey, you know what, award shows seem, seem like an interesting thing. You're not going to go out there and learn, uh, you know, introduce yourself to the producer of that show. But you find out who the designer of that show is and you dog them until, you know, they give you a shot at working with them. And then over time you learn, you know, you learn the, the different personalities in it and, and your career grows. But the very real, real you know, it's sort of a joke. You guys are too young to worry about, you know, your personal life or, or whether it's $4 signs or $3 signs. But 10 years down the road, you know, you want to be in a place where you have the flexibility to do, do what you want with your life. Um, you know, a lot of people look down at TV. And I just got a call last week for this project. This is the set for uh, Biggest Loser right now. And... Uh, you know what? The show is a success. It's great. They make a lot of money off it. But it's like working out in a basement. So what, why, why even worry about what it's designed like when you have an incredibly successful show? Well, because it doesn't have to be this. For the same amount of money, it could be that, which is what I've just pitched to them uh, as a new look for, for it that's inspirational, aspirational. It's you know, a place where you could actually feel good trying to regain your health and fitness rather than feeling like you're in the prison yard. Design does matter. And it matters at every level, whether it's details or the big picture. And we'll get into that. So, in my mind, the tools for good design 
I don't have all of them in here. Well, yeah, I do. Um, these are the, the, the tools that I employ to make great looking sets. Light, color, texture, FG, MG, BG, foreground, midground, background. And I'll talk about some of this stuff as we get into the slides. Levels of detail. Every one of the slides that I'm going to show you is going to embody all of these aspects. And I don't think you can get a great looking show if you drop any one of them out. Already you can see light. I designed in the lights on just about all of this. All of this lighting, um, you know, the, the internal lighting that's in the steps and underneath it. I think about, and I talk to my lighting designer from the very start. You can't see, you can't see a set in the dark. So you might as well figure out how to maximize what you can do with it, what the lighting designer can do with it. And there's a lot of tools to do that. Um, I've also <clears throat> filled this with little tidbits of wisdom that I wanted to know 17 years ago. When you look at a material or a form, look beyond what it is and instead consider what it can be. This floor goes back to texture on that first list. This floor is ceiling tiles, the type you would stick in uh, a dropped ceiling in, in a, an office building. And they're translucent. Turned around, put on a floor, it makes for a hell of a nice texture. Nobody else has it, you know. But if you think about product in a different way, you can find all kinds of things that you can use uh, in, in uh, you know, surprising new ways. Uh, layers, mid-ground, foreground, background. We're looking through an etched $100 bill to the rest of the set. The, if you provide tools for the camera to work with, uh, like foreground and a midground, not only do you expand the space, uh, but you can create interesting shots that they can pan through, that they can pick up characters in, in it. And it's not limited to you know, a game show like this, but um, I think it, it's you know, critical to all good design. I always say, it's like, if you're looking at the night sky, and there weren't any stars up there, you might as well be in a dark closet. You have no sense of the expanse of what the universe is, except for the fact that you have mid-ground and background. Never listen too closely to what your client says, because they don't really know what they want until you show it to them. This, that's, a, that's not to say don't listen to your client, but most of the time they don't really know what they want, and they're counting on you to use your infinite wisdom to create what they want. This started out as, this was the California lottery, it started out as a junkyard of California artifacts. They wanted the Golden Gate Bridge, the Man Chinese, the Hollywood Hills, and I said, no you don't. That's not a cutting edge game show. You want to make the lottery as hip as let's make a deal or whatever. And so instead I proposed something that picked up on some of the glamour of Vegas, the gold, the lights, the, you know, the slick surfaces, and they looked at it and they loved it. So listen, but don't listen too closely. This had to be a very adaptable set. And you can see lighting is involved in the whole thing. Even these lights, not only can you chase them, but you can dim them, but they provide a texture in and of themselves. So you can, you can hit all those initial seven points again and again. Unanimous. <clears throat> this was a reality show. We had to put ten people inside of the space until, until they decided which one of them walked out with a million dollars. Reality shows are a different animal. They have to be pretty fantastic, but they have to be also believably real. And this is where scenery you know, in a non-scripted show, scenery comes in and it makes the show. Uh, we tried to put them in a place where they were effectively in limbo. They didn't know if they were above ground, below ground, um, in a warehouse, in an office building. No one thanks you for being on budget, only for a great set. Doesn't need any explaining. Nobody ever comes to me and says, oh God, thank you for being under budget. It's only a compliment if you've done your, a really great job on the set. Now, I'll get to the second half of that, which is not to ignore budget, but don't let it be your only guiding you know, constraint. Um, <clears throat> this set was actually interesting because we made a large um, 
pool of water in it, which made it really feel infinite because you didn't know how far down it was. We painted it black. And uh, it's also interesting that it's lined with mirror almost on all three sides because there's a camera aisle behind it so you can shoot people from any angle. And yet you could stand in the middle of the space and not see yourself in any mirror in it. The central voting area in it. Again, much of the same premises, backlit surfaces, you know, practical lighting. Uh, texture. Here's a, <clears throat> I can't believe this show exists, but it's also a great example of how even on a really tight budget, you can always do, uh, you know, the things that make for good visual design. Everything in here has some kind of a texture. This is a paint texture, and it's played on simple rectangles against a psych. You know, the psych, all of them are lighting elements. This is a vacuform. We pull a lot of our own vacuform, any pattern we want to make. You know, this header is a pattern that I just created, and I had the shop manufacture it. All the lighting that you see that's internal, like this, this, up above, inside the columns, these things, those are things that I designed into the set to begin with, before the lighting designer even touches it. It's not enough to light the show, but it's enough to give it a sculpting that, that he could never do with instruments out in front. Uh, the, look at the difference between this shot and the next shot. And the point I was going to make with those is that lighting in it of itself can be a set. Sometimes you get a camera shot and you have nothing to fill it with. They've changed the angle they're shooting it at, you didn't plan for it, what do you do? Uh, you talk to your lighting designer and you ask him to throw some beams up get a little atmosphere in the sky, um, and all of a sudden you've got a background uh, you know, out of vapor. Uh, the point is, look at all the, all the tools that you have to draw on when you get into designing projects. <clears throat> uh, there's always time to make something better. We finished rehearsal, and we are looking at close-up shots against these backplates, and we weren't happy with them. We were taping the next day. I decided to add these light boxes, and we did it overnight. Uh, really simple light box, just simple bulbs in it. Screwed it on the next morning, and by noon we were taping a show. The close-up shots were tremendously better, again, because we had you know, a, a lighting element to add variety to it. So, and I could give you a thousand examples of in the last minute uh, making a change all for the better. Uh, this is a neat shot because it shows you a cheap way to double the amount of your set. I love using a gloss floor. If this was anything but gloss floor, the set would end right here. It'd be from here up. But the camera loves it too. I've got twice the scenery for the, pr single, the cost of one set. And any which way you turn, you've got a great looking pattern somewhere in that floor. Master Chef, now you saw this. Some of you saw this. Another reality show. Again, most of the same techniques, backlit surfaces, layers, we're looking through numerous things, texture, the, the, the egg uh, or the cheese grater, um, and internally lit elements, lit floor. Uh, and there's a density that you have to think about. If you think about the way you look at stuff with 180 degree plus you know, peripheral vision, uh, you get a lot of visual information, and the world doesn't look so boring. But when you're looking through a camera lens and you're really looking at a spot this big, suddenly a wall that only had a, a small blank spot in it might be the only thing you have in the background. So in a sense, what you're designing for is a hyper-reality, just a little bit more than what you would really do so that wherever the camera turns, it has a, it has a uh, background and a texture and a quality that's pleasing. Now this goes back to no one thanks you for being on budget. You go over budget $300 at a time. <clears throat> the thing to remember, whether you're doing theater or you're doing TV or you're doing your own kitchen remodel at home, is that any design project has hundreds of decisions, and there are hundreds of $300 decisions. Do you buy a $100 chair or do you buy a $400 chair? Do you buy 10 of them? Do you buy you know, three of them? You know, 10 $300 decision 